I hope you enjoyed that material from last week. If I had to do a one-sentence summary, I would say, Jesus is Lord. And and as a reminder, um, those of you that are hearing this online and you feel like you're ready to come in for Sunday school, what we do is we discuss next Sunday the material that you're hearing right now. So if you hear it online and then come to class, you're well ready to engage in the conversations that we have about the Word. So let's begin with prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for that strong, detailed reminder last week that your Son, Jesus Christ, is our eternal priest of peace and righteousness. We look forward to continued strong good word this week. The more we know, the more we grow. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, last week we delved deep into ancient Jewish thinking to understand that Jesus has completed the Old Testament law and further, he has completed and surpassed the Levitical priesthood. Melchizedek was an Old Testament type of Jesus. He was an eternal priest who received tithes from the Levitical priesthood through Abraham. He showed his superiority to Abraham and the Levitical priesthood by blessing him and them. Jesus is the eternal priest who goes to the Father on our behalf. We give our lives to him. He blesses us. Our faith is well-placed, for Jesus is worthy and well-able. Let's begin this week in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Again, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. If perfection were attained through the Levitical priesthood, for through it the people received the law, What further need was there that another priest should rise in the order of Melchizedek rather than established in the order of Aaron? This point is crucial. Judaism might argue that the Levitical priesthood works, so there is no need for change. You know, it's, it's like the old joke, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if that were true, we'd still be burning candles instead of enjoying electricity and light. And the reality is clearly the Levitical priesthood does not work. The Old Testament cycles of Jewish sin, repentance, forgiveness, blessing, and then the gradual return to sin is well known. If change was needed, why didn't Melchizedek's priesthood beat out Levites early on, you might ask? Well, it was never meant to. The Jews and all peoples had to learn that God's righteousness could not be satisfied by willpower or physical sacrifice. The Levitical priesthood had to run its course to show us the futility of religion that centered on human righteousness. Melchizedek was not meant to become the religious order of Judaism. He was a type of the priesthood that would fulfill God's righteousness. He showed us that one would come that would allow us to reconcile with God. He predicted Jesus' role as priest. And let me say that one more time because this is the crucial point thus far. Melchizedek predicted Jesus' role as priest. Let's continue with verses 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 7 12 and 13, for a change in the priesthood necessitates a change in the law. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe from which no man served at the altar. Let's just define this. 
Jesus would be a priest for Christians who come from all peoples and who do not need go-betweens to serve at altars. Continuing with verse 14, Hebrews chapter 7, beginning with 14, for it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe concerning which Moses said nothing about priests. This is far more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who becomes a priest not by a law pertaining to ancestry, but by the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Here Jesus is contrasted with the Levitical priest. He did not come from the line of Levi, but from the non-priesthood line of Judah. Here Jesus is compared to Melchizedek because both are eternal. Continuing with verse 18, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 18. For there is then an annulling of the previous commandment due to its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but now a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Here again, the deficiency of the Levitical priesthood is highlighted. The sacrifices were temporary. Alas, so was the righteousness of God's people. Sometimes it got so bad that God came to despise their sacrifices. Hosea 8.13 is an example. Hosea chapter 8, verse 13 the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it. But the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. God never intended for repentance and forgiveness to become a license for on going sin. And isn't it interesting that this problem from over 3,000 years ago remains an issue in the Christian church today. The process of repentance and forgiveness was never intended to be a license for ongoing sin. This was the failure of Levitical Judaism. And it is a failure of what is sometimes called cheap grace in the Christian world. God did not accept the sacrifices of the ancient Jews. What made us think he will accept our shallow confessions. If we keep on sinning while saying God is love, God forgives. Lord, have mercy. Continuing with verse 20, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 20. And he was not made a priest without an oath. Other priests were made without an oath, but this one with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Through this oath, Jesus became the guarantor of a better covenant. So often we are accused of interpreting the Bible for our own opinions. Here, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear. Jesus is a priest forever, just as Melchizedek was. The new covenant is superior. Grace is superior to the law and sacrifices. 
The law did not improve Israel's righteousness. The law did not bring peace or righteousness. What it did was expose our sin and the futility of human willpower to overcome it. Consider the rich young man. He believed he was a law abider. He believed he had peace and righteousness. Jesus exposed his guilt and told him how to resolve it. Imagine somebody said, here's your problem. Here's how to fix it. But the rich young man went away sad for the Bible says he was very rich. You see, he was not righteous. He was greedy. He did not have peace for he sought out Jesus, an immediate sign that he knew he lacked something. He did not have peace, for he rejected the peace giver. Grace brings righteousness and peace. Consider the gifts of the church to humanity. Literacy is mostly the product of Protestant church missionaries. They knew that with literacy, people could read their Bibles. Indeed, so many of the universities throughout the world were founded by Christian missionaries. Freedom and human dignity are inherent in the Bible. The abolitionist movement, which opposed slavery, was largely a Christian movement. Many of the early civil rights leaders in the African-American community were ministers of the gospel. Let us not forget that Martin Luther King Jr. was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The organizations that led to women's voting rights were often Christianity-inspired organizations. After all, Jesus was unique in the dignity he directed towards women. It may be argued that some Christians are not righteous. Our goal is always redemption. That's why I served in prison ministry for 25 years. That's why we have recovery ministries for the homeless, for the drug addicted, and even for ministers who have moral failures. However, we Christians, we are a righteous people. Many who call themselves Christians will be rejected on the day of judgment. Many who call themselves Christians never really were. And some who failed many times will find ultimate righteousness and perhaps this is the greatest truth of all. God really does forgive. And his righteousness is available even for those who stumble many times. The other truth is that we Christians have peace. For sure, there are Christians in therapy. Indeed, there is a growing supply of Christian therapists. Nevertheless, we have peace in the time of storm. We have the Holy Spirit. We know all things work together for good. And we know we're going to heaven to live with God, our priest, forever. The last truth, that last truth means more today than it did when I was 40. And some of you listening to my voice are like, 40, oh my goodness, that's old. Well, now that I'm 57, this truth about heaven and about God being our priest forever means a lot more than it did 17 years ago. And I got to tell you, it means so very much more than it did when I was 20 exponentially more than when I was redeemed at the age of 10. I suspect that I am 
when I am in my 70s, should the Lord tarry, the promise of heaven and eternity with my priest will mean everything. Jesus is my priest. Hallelujah. Let's continue with verse 23, Hebrews 7 and verse 23. And the former priests were numerous because they were hindered from serving because of death. But he, because he lives forever, has an everlasting priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Because he at all times lives to make intercession for them. This is a simple but powerful truth. Human priests die. Jesus is always and forever. Further, he never stops interceding to the Father on our behalf. Verse 26, Hebrews 7 and verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, for he is holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and is higher than the heavens. These descriptions of Jesus clearly show that he is the superior priest. He is holy and innocent. The earthly priests were not. When Elijah faced the 450 prophets of Baal, were they not official Jewish clergy of the day? He is undefiled and separate from sinners. The earthly priests were not. Jeremiah 6.13 offers a terrible reminder of how corrupt priests are can be. It says, Jeremiah 6.13, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. And again, I say, Lord, have mercy. He is higher than the heavens. The earthly priests were not. This one is simple. (laughs) The priests were only human, whereas Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Let's conclude this chapter reading verse Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. Hebrews 7, beginning with 27. Unlike those high priests, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men who are weak as high priest. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who is made perfect forever. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is the only eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus alone is worthy and authorized to forgive our sins and to bestow his righteousness and peace. What have we said today? Jesus is the one co-eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Again, he brings peace. He brings righteousness. Jesus was needed because the old priesthood failed. The Levites sinned and became corrupt. They had to repent and seek forgiveness for themselves before they could seek it for the nation. Their efforts brought only temporary forgiveness and restoration Jesus finally is the preeminent one. Only he is co-eternal with the Father. Only he is righteous and peaceful. Only he brings lasting forgiveness and restoration. Let's pray. Father, 
in Jesus' name. What can we say? We are ashamed of our feeble efforts at righteousness and our strenuous yet always failing attempts at peacemaking. We thank you that Jesus is pure righteousness and pure peace. Would you fill us with Christ, his spirit, his peace, his righteousness, and help us to allow the light of Jesus to shine in us for a world desperate for righteousness, desperate for peace, really unknowing, but desperate for Jesus. Help us, we pray. And it is in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.